Well, welcome once again to Westminster Presbyterian Church this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I ask that you open them to James chapter 3. We'll be in James chapter 3, verse 2 through verse 12. And if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine? produce figs. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Thus far the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we ask that by your Holy Spirit you would make us to hear, understand, and love your word this morning. We ask that you would search our hearts and show us if there be anything unclean within us. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would use even the realization of our own sin to confess that we misuse our tongues. That you would give us the grace to tame our tongues. That we might be more and more drawn to Christ and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And if you have not already opened your Bibles to James chapter 3, I ask that you turn there with me now as we continue on our walk through this epistle of James. And very quickly, I'll remind you where we stand on this path so far. As you'll remember, James chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 deals with the subject of trials and especially how the Christian is to respond to those trials. Then in verses 19 through 27... James identifies for us true Christianity, distinguishing it from a false or simply claimed Christianity. Another name for that may be nominal Christianity. And in that section, James, in fact, gives us several tests to look for in order to better ascertain the sincerity of our faith. Then in James chapter 2, we see the evidence of true faith. And that, primarily, in that true faith is combined with loving obedience in the Christian life. Then in James chapter 3, we see the subject of the tongue, or rather, how we use our tongues in our speech. And so the structure of James' letter is clear and logical. It's interconnected. It's internally coherent. But the connection is this. If you look real fast at James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, you'll see that James has given three areas that indicate a true and living faith. In other words, 
How do you identify someone who really is a Christian or who is really a Christian? How do you make the distinction between someone who claims to be a Christian and someone who actually is a Christian? <clears throat> and to help us work this out, James gives three tests of how Christianity impacts a person's life. The first test he gives is the tongue. The second area is in our care, love, and concern for the needy. And the third is the area of resisting the world or worldliness. And he takes up each of these areas throughout the epistle. The second area, that of love, care, and concern for the needy, he actually deals with principally in chapter 2, which we've already looked at in detail. Then he'll deal with the tongue, the first area mentioned in verse 26 of chapter 1, here in chapter 3. And then from the end of chapter 3, basically to the end of the book, he tackles the subject of worldliness and our being separate from the world as believers. And what he means there, very quickly, is twofold. First, that we behave. We act in such a way that we love the world in the sense of having a concern and a desire for its best interest, while simultaneously not loving the world in the sense that we get caught up in the worldliness, the ungodly thinking and behavior of the world around us. Remember, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. So that gives you very quickly an outline of James, where we've been and where we're going. Now, as for where we are on this path, we said that James, in the passage we studied the last time we were together, applied his teaching about the tongue, most especially to the teachers of the church. That was in verses 1 and 2. But we also said, even then, that what he was saying was not only for teachers. In fact, it was for all Christians. And that becomes very obvious in the passage that we're look looking at today, in this section, verses 2 through 12. Now, in this section, we see four things that show us why a Christian's speech, how they use their tongues, is so incredibly important. And we see this in four different ways. We see that it has, first, a disproportionate influence. Second, that it does incredible damage. Thirdly, that our speech shows how untamable our tongues are. And then finally, we'll briefly ask the question, is there such a thing as transubstantial fruit? So first, disproportionate influence. Look with me again at verse 2. And I know we covered verse 2 itself last time, but I think it's important that we repeat it, repeat it again here because it is absolutely vital that we realize we will not be perfect in any area of our lives this side of glory, but especially with our tongues. Verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Now, before we get into the analogies here, I want to point out that three times in this section, James makes it very clear that he is talking to believers. How do we see that? We see it first in verse 1, then in verse 10, and finally again in verse 12. We see it because he calls them brothers. Verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, Verse 10b, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. And then finally in verse 12, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? In fact, James calls the readers of this epistle, he calls us who are in Christ over a dozen times in this epistle, brothers. 
So it is quite clear that he considers his readers to be Christians. Why is this important? Well, at the risk of giving away the plot here, the rest of my sermon, because sanctification in all of these areas from chapters 1, verses 26 through 27, including the taming of the tongue, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. I can't do it. But God can, and God does, because you are in Christ. So to get back on track here, just look at how appropriate the illustrations that Jane uses about the tongue are. First in verse 3, we get the illustration of a horse and a bit, or another way you might say that is a horse and a bridle. And the point is this, that even though a man is significantly smaller than a horse, if we use something that is even more disproportionately small in comparison to the size of the horse, and that, and it's no coincidence here, in the mouth of the horse, in the hands of a skilled rider, it can be used with great effectiveness to control a large and powerful animal with ease. And James is saying that it's exactly the same thing with the tongue. Even though the tongue is an incredibly small part of our bodies in comparison with, say, our legs or our torso, that even though it is exceedingly small, it has a disproportionately large influence in our lives and in the lives of others. In fact, it has a greater impact on our lives than any other part of our bodies with the exception of our minds. And the reason I'm not saying our hearts in this particular instance is because our heart is simply a muscle that pumps blood through our bodies. When the, when the Bible says our hearts, our bowels, it's essentially talking about our minds and our souls working together. And here in verse 3, James really drives this point home. And, you know, just, just in case you don't really see it in your life already. He essentially says, you know how a horse's bit guides its entire body? Well, that's exactly what the tongue does to your body. And the question is this. Who has control of the reins? Who has control of the reins? Why? Why? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. Whatever we say, our bodies and the bodies of our brothers and sisters will bear the weight of it. And so James uses this first illustration to emphasize the re relative importance of what we say. And then... With barely a pause to take a breath, he jumps right into the second illustration to show the disproportionate influence of the tongue when he says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Now, of course, this is from a time of great sailing vessels the way they got from point A to point B across the Mediterranean, etc. And that can make it a little difficult for us to grasp his meaning here in some cases, because we've never felt the power of the wind as it catches the sails and the ship lurches forward with, and with one very tiny turn of the wheel, you can veer off course by hundreds of miles. Think about a transatlantic uh, voyage. If you're just off by a degree, at when you start on that voyage, you're off by hundreds, even thousands of miles at the end of your voyage. But that doesn't mean we can't understand this analogy. Because God's word is timeless. After all, we have all seen the movies where large ships are caught in a big storm. The wind is howling and blowing and breaking these masts made from massive tree trunks. It would be absolutely terrifying in that situation. But in the midst of all that chaos, that ship is guided by a pilot using what? A small rudder. What is in comparison to the rest of the ship, a very small instrument. And you wouldn't think that such a small part of the ship could control it in such a way. We can even see it today with massive, 
massive ships like an aircraft carrier. You look at the rudders in comparison to the size of the ship, and it's very, very small. But it does. It controls it, and it controls it absolutely perfectly, relatively speaking. Wrong use of words. But it does, and that's the point. It has a disproportionate influence on the direction of the ship. And so again, using this illustration, James shows the disproportionate influence of the tongue on our lives. The point is this, that the tongue is capable of tremendous influence, and we all, whether those doing the talking or those around them, will have to deal with the consequences. Because after all, on the ship, it's not only the pilot that is on that ship. It's all the passengers as well. But we'll get into that a little more detail shortly. But we all know this truth exp experientially. Every one of us sees this in our lives. In some ways, it's just common sense, or perhaps a better way to say it is it's a common grace truth. For example, you've probably heard the saying, don't let your mouth write a check, your backside can't cash. <laughs> My dad used to put it this way, your alligator mouth is about to bite off more than your parakeet backside can chew. We knew we were about to get in trouble when he said that. While there are myriad speeches in history that prove this point as well, we don't have to look to famous speeches by world leaders like Winston Churchill or Teddy Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan or Caesar, you know, take your pick, to prove the point that the tongue is disproportionately influential. Just by something as simply as remembering what my dad told my brother and I 30 years ago, we can see, for example, that fathers have a very unique capacity in this area. How our tongues can be used to great influence, either for good or for evil. And it's my guess that moms and dads both can recognize this experience. You're sitting at home, and as usual, something happens. Chaos erupts. Something has gone terribly wrong in your parenting plan, and the kids are doing something that more than likely they shouldn't have been doing, and as you sit down and talk to them about what's happened, you start racking your brain. What did dad tell me when I was doing this? And kids, yeah, they probably did it too. Your parents are also sinners. That's why they need Christ just like you need Christ. What did dad tell me when I was doing this? What was it that mom told me when I was doing this? And you're just searching for some bit of wisdom to share in this moment. And then sure enough, something that they told you just comes out of your mouth almost involuntarily. Sometimes it's good, sometimes not so much. We tend to lose our tempers and we tend to lose our tongues curse rather than bless. And what do we do in those moments? We confess. Confess your sins, even to your children. I sinned against you in this way. That's why I need Christ. That's why you need Christ. But you find these phrases that your parents have imprinted upon your mind just coming out in your own speech as you deal with your own children, and we see the power that speech can have on us every single day. Most of us, even you kids, can remember times that were very difficult, where the world seemed to be collapsing all around us, and the words of encouragement from friends, from family, sometimes the Lord may even use an absolute stranger on the street where the difference between absolute despair and tremendous hope come rushing forward. With just a few words, you are reminded that there was some light at the end of this tunnel. Beloved, it is amazing how a kind word, fitly spoken, completely changed how you are viewing that situation. And James is stressing just how powerful, how disproportionately powerful an instrument the tongue is. And if we're paying attention at all to the desire to be like Christ, 
if we are paying attention at all to the desire to live what we say we believe, if we are paying attention at all to wanting to grow in holiness, then James is saying that one area that you cannot leave out of your consideration is your tongue. You've got to think about your speech and what your speech says about your holiness, about your edification, about your sanctification. Now, what does that mean for us as Christians? Well, have you realized, Christian, how vital, how influential your tongue is? Do you realize how important it is in your own sanctification? And if so, what are we doing about it? Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. You may publicly profess to be a Christian, but not actually be a Christian, or you may not claim to be a Christian at all. But either way, you may be secretly thinking to yourself that you don't need God's grace to be saved. You're going to pass all these tests that James is talking about just fine. No problem, no issue. Well, consider this. What about your tongue? What does your tongue tell you about your need of grace? Now, we'll come back to this thought in just a bit, but think on those things, beloved, because James is first and foremost pressing home to us that the tongue is a key to holy living. But the bottom line is, the tongue has a very disproportionate influence. And even unbelievers, even the world, the world recognizes this reality. And they recognize it, among other things, because the tongue can and often does cause incredible damage. Our second point. In fact, James says that it's like a fire tearing through and utterly disfiguring and destroying a forest. We've seen the damage that fires can do to a forest. And that fire in our tongues is ignited by hell. Look at verse 5b. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Beloved, our words can be absolutely devastating to those we are speaking to or about. And we see the truth of this statement in the world all around us as well. And how much damage have you seen done to the lives of individuals, of families, of companies, of governments by things like gossip, slander, and lies? We've all seen, for example, in recent years, how a, how a lie about someone, often in order to slander them, is so easily passed along from person to person, either face to face, on social media, whatever the case may be. And through this gossip, that person's life is absolutely, utterly destroyed. They lose their jobs. They lose college scholarships. They lose their reputation. And in some cases, they lose their families along the way because their spouse, their kids, they just can't handle the pressure. And all because of the tongue. All of this damage done by an errant word. All of this carnage has been inflicted by what is set on fire by hell. Beloved, the tongue, because of its disproportionate influence, causes incredible damage. And so we must strive to hold even our tongues in subjection to Christ. We must endeavor to tame our tongues. And yet, James makes it clear that we have an untamable tongue. Look at verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. So what's James saying here? What's his point? Quite simply, that the tongue cannot be controlled by us. 
I cannot control my tongue. You cannot control your tongue in our own strength. Even though God gave mankind in the creation mandate the command to subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth, we fail time and time again to have dominion over our own tongues. Even though throughout history, mankind has proven to be very adept at taming animals. I mean, have you been to the zoo lately? Or SeaWorld? It's absolutely amazing what those people have been able to train killer whales, dolphins, seals, otters to do. So by God's grace, we are still given the ability to tame every kind of animal, and yet no human being can tame the tongue. And James isn't the only one who tells us this. You remember Paul's indictment of the total depravity of man in Romans 3, right? He spends two chapters telling the Christians in Rome, Rome how both Jews and Gentiles fail to meet the righteous standard of God's law. But there are some who still think that they can do it. He's seen this time and time and time again. He's heard this question. He's heard these claims. And so he's speaking rhetorically. They think they can do it. They don't need the grace of God to be justified in his sight. And so beginning in verse 10, Paul just obliterates any sense of self-righteousness. And he does that by launching into quotation after quotation of the Old Testament. What's he turned to right in the middle of this devastating discourse? Look real quickly at Romans 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Romans 3, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. That's from Psalm 5, verse 9. The venom of asps is under their lips. Psalm 140, verse 3. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Psalm 10, verse 7. So when Paul wants to convince you that you are a sinner, completely incapable of justifying yourself before God, that you need grace to be saved, one of the things he does is that he turns to your tongue. He turns to our speech. And he says that your tongue, how you speak, shows you, it proves to you that you need the forgiveness of sins. That you need, as Martin Luther used to say, an alien righteousness. And if somebody responds to Paul, well, Paul, I'm not a sinner. I don't need this Jesus that you speak of. I don't need this grace from God that you're talking about. Paul's response, once again, is, you don't, huh? Well, let's just look at your speech for a second. What does your speech say about you? Well, that speech, the way we speak to one another, shows all of us, every single man, woman, and child, how hopeless and helpless we are to change ourselves. Beloved, James says, no one can tame the tongue. We have to look to and go outside of ourselves for the ability to change our speech. And this because our tongue reveals our hearts. Dear ones, our heart is not the solution to our tongues. So anyone who tells you, just look within and find the goodness within, within us, has no solution, not only for the tongue, but for your heart. Because the tongue is a heart problem. The tongue problem is a heart problem. So if you're going to solve the tongue problem, excuse me, which is a heart problem, you can't look to the heart. You have to look somewhere else. Where do we look? We look to Christ. We look to Christ because he is the solution. Because if we don't, 
we will be walking contradictions. And James shows us this in verses 9 through 12, where he says, With it, and by that he means the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So is it possible? Is there such a thing as transubstantial fruit? Can something be one thing over here, and yet be something else over here? Of course not. The essence of a thing, of that which is physical and material, does not change in its substance, which is what transubstantial means. But what are the implications of what James is saying here? Well, this point is that the tongue, though made by God to be a blessing, can be used for good and evil. And not only by non-Christians. As I said before, in verses 10 and verse 12 here, James repeats the phrase, my brothers. And with those words, he's indicating that he considers the people to whom he is currently writing to be brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And yet, and yet, they are struggling with this inconsistency in their language. Now, he never actually specifies what that inconsistency is. Maybe he hints at it when he speaks of boasting in verse 5. Where he says the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So maybe he's speaking more specifically of prideful speech. But given that he has already mentioned what we say, generally speaking, in verse 2, I think it's probably far more likely uh, that, that it, it's just generally speaking here. And the bottom line is that the sins of the tongue are almost too many to number. He could be speaking in this case about lying. He could be speaking about misleading or nagging or gossiping. He could be speaking about that cynical, satirical, cutting speech, which is designed to demean another image bearer. And yet, we, Christians, across the country and around the world, sit in church, just as one example, every Sunday and sing praises and pray to God. And so James is perceiving that the tongue is used both to worship God rightly and then wrongly to malign those who are made in the image of God. And in verse 12, or 10 rather, he says, My brothers, these things ought not to be so. You can hear him pleading with you. Christian. It should not be this way. James is saying that the tongue itself, in its use and its misuse, reveals deep-seated inconsistencies in our spiritual lives. He's making it clear that there is no such thing as transubstantial fruit. But this is difficult for us to recognize, confess, and repent of. Because often, when we see something in our own lives that we don't like, some sin that has been made evident to us, what do we do? Downplay it at a minimum. Ignore it or deny it. Now, other sins by other people are big, but not our sin. No, our sin is just a little petty, insignificant thing. If it's anything at all, it's not a real problem. And what does James say in verses 8 through 10? He says that the tongue, our speech, is a big problem. It's a real problem. In other words, it's a real big problem. Because there is no such thing as transubstantial fruit. 
And so when we see ourselves using the tongue both for blessing and for cursing, James is saying that you're seeing evidence of that deep-seated inconsistency in the Christian life that needs to be corrected. But how do we do that? How do we do it? How do we correct our tongues? In other words, how do we tame the untamable? We run to God. We flee to Christ for grace. And it requires us to both humble ourselves in prayer before God, to consider even the way that we're talking to one another, and to be vigilant in monitoring the use of our tongues. Because James is pointing us here to the grace of God. James is preaching to us the mercy of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, because no man can tame the tongue. The tongue is untamable by you and by me. And this is because it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. But beloved, that does not mean it is hopeless. We are not forever doomed to allow this tiny little member of our bodies to have its disproportionate influence. Beloved, no matter how much damage has been done, no matter how strong this sin is in our lives, the grace of God in Christ Jesus is stronger. Amen. Maybe you're struggling with the tongue this morning, and I can guarantee that you are, by the way, because no one can tame the tongue. But maybe you're struggling with gossip, or maybe you're struggling with nagging, or with, with lying, or, or with boasting. Maybe you so desire the esteem of your classmates or your co-workers that you'll say anything to get them to think you're cool. Maybe you're building yourself up by cutting other people down. And kids, I'm talking to you specifically here with your siblings. Maybe you're sharing rumors causing division in your family, at school, or even in the church. But beloved, all of these things point to a sin problem. They point to a heart problem that can't be resolved in or by ourselves. It can only be solved by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And so whether we are Christians struggling with this sin, or whether we're non-Christians struggling with this sin. We need to run to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ for the answer. Because he is the answer. If you're not a Christian, then run to the Lord Jesus Christ to be changed. Flee to him to be transformed. Now I'm not saying that you turn to him in order to turn over a new leaf. What you do is you turn to him so that you can be saved from your sin. If you are a Christian, then I implore you, beloved, to realize that when we are doing this, when we are sinning in this way, when we're misusing our tongues, then we're not acting like Christians. When we're committing these sins of the tongue, we need to apply ourselves in prayer to Christ for grace so that we might grow, so that we might stop this misuse of our tongues and use it for godly purposes, so that we might use our tongues to glorify God. Because James is teaching us here that the tongue is, humanly speaking, uncontrollable. It holds a disproportionate influence in that it does incredible damage, and it is untamable outside of the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His blood poured out for you and applied to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, so that you might do that which is pleasing to God the Father and give glory 
to our triune God. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we confess that our tongues are a restless evil, that we use them to give glory to you and then turn right around and curse our fellow man. But you, O Lord, are gracious beyond measure, and you have redeemed us. Even our tongues, despite the damage that we have inflicted with them, so that you may be praised. So may we sing praises to your name. May we pray to you and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to others so that the tongues of all of your sheep will sing praises to your name. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.